or you just wait until the end. Uh, it's completely up to you. But because Michelle is is also uh, knowledgeable and so and knows what's going to happen, you guys, she she you can coordinate with her if she interrupts or not. And I'll just Hopefully, leave it to you. And if you need me, I'll be here. <laughs> okay, very good. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, we'll we'll do it that way. So if there's any questions, please, um, everybody who's watching already, just um, ask them in the chat. If it's uh, useful to to discuss it immediately, then Michelle will coordinate that, and otherwise we'll we'll have a collection of questions at the end, and then address those um, towards the end. Yeah. Okay. So let's um, let's give it one. Maybe I can start by introducing uh, yeah. you both. So uh, well, introducing the workshop. In this uh, in this workshop, we'll be talking about single particle tracking um, via the classical uh, approach, which is uh, uh, light microscopy and uh, using nanobodies or palm or whatever it is. And you you we have had uh, talks in the morning talking about it, so it's actually perfect. And uh, but we also have a bit of ice cat, and uh, David and Michelle will explain to all of us what it is and how you can uh, expand uh, your toolkit if you're doing live cell imaging. Okay, so now ah, let me just say that uh, we we I worked with David in London, so I know him quite well. So I know this is going to be very interesting. Uh, <laughs> so no pressure. And uh, now the floor is yours, David and Michelle. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, and uh, thank you, Pedro, for giving us the opportunity to present uh, some of the methods we're uh, excited to work with here. Um, yeah, so this will be in um, a workshop in two parts, where we're going to first talk uh, about um, a bit more of a classic approach that uh, probably a lot of you are familiar with, uh, using fluorescent labels for single particle tracking, and then the second part, will um, work towards using a scattering label and doing some live ice get, hopefully. So um, let's get started in section one. So we and many others are very much interested in membranes as they're just a very uh, vital part of biology. Um, compartmentalizing just about any uh, any organelle and being very complex structures. And uh, I'll, I'll just start with um, with this as a little bit of a motivational slide. So on on the left, you you have uh, one of these many cartoons that you're all familiar with, um, and we know the composition of uh, of membranes, um, but but a lot of our knowledge how they uh, how they actually look like, how they behave, come from uh, microscopy methods. And here on the right is a it's a typical image of a COS7 cell that is expressing uh, GFP GPI, uh, a GPI anchored GFP that is in the outer leaflet, and it's a very nice membrane stain. And then we can look at the at the membrane of a of a cell. Um, and in in general, the the membrane is relevant for so many different uh, aspects of biomedical science because it's involved in in pretty much any uh, form of of signaling. Uh, any cellular interaction, and then also if we if we think about pathogens uh, like viruses, um, the membrane is the barrier the virus has to has to cross. So there's a lot of uh, interest in um, uh, in membranes in in general. And single particle tracking is just one very cool method um, that can tell us uh, more about the membrane. Now, the the idea really is that we want to investigate. Uh, properties of individual molecules and thereby gain some information about their interactions and eventually their function in a in a cellular context and if i just if i just play this uh, this video here um this uh, example of uh, single uh, molecule imaging by by fluorescents um we have a lot of different species of uh, fluorescent molecules here so we have this this very large and bright blob that's hardly moving so that might be um, it might be like a large vesicle, an aggregate. Um, there's uh, a lot of free fluorophores that are just floating around, and then there's some that appear to be uh, moving in a um, so in a 2D 2D plane. So just by 
just by tracking single molecules, we can we can deduce a lot about what is um, what's happening to the molecule there that it attached to. Now, there's a number of requirements for uh, for single particle tracking, and first of all, it's it's important we need a specific label. So we want our label to be um, on a on a specific molecule, and we want to be certain about that. At the same time, we need uh, a sufficiently high spatial temporal resolution. Now we'll we'll talk a little bit about localization later, but the um, if you, if you look at these uh, uh, diffusing molecules here, it's uh, it's fairly simple in a in a single frame to to localize one of those um, as long as we have enough signal. So it's it's really the signal to noise ratio. Um, and let me see if I can get the laser pointer. So. Um, so then you know where where I'm pointing at the at the screen. Now um, now if we have a high enough spatial resolution, we can we can localize our molecules. But then we also need a sufficiently high temporal resolution because if the molecule is moving much faster than we're imaging, uh, it's it's not going to be any good. And uh, in the end, it's also very important to acquire lots of data for statistical analysis because we can't really by just looking at a single molecule then make assumptions about the entire population of uh, of molecules so usually whenever you you do a single molecule tracking single particle tracking you want a lot of data now there's a there's a number of fluorescent labels that are uh, that are common and that you're probably familiar with there's small organic dyes that are bright um relatively photostable so so very nice for uh, for tracking uh, the the typical GFP, you can um, uh, you can express um, as a as a fusion protein construct, and then there's quantum dots, uh, bright but unfortunately blinking, that can be used for for single particle tracking as well. And these are um, some some typical fluorescent labels, and then there's scattering labels such as gold nanoparticles, and we'll come to uh, we'll come to those later. Now this um session is about single particle tracking using nanobodies and one of the one of the big advantages is that nanobodies are single domain binders that you can use to label a single molecule um so you're not uh not in the problem like with a, with a polyclonal antibody that you're not really sure what your labeling ratio is and the other advantage is that there's um, already quite a collection of, of nanobodies against different targets. For example, there's a very uh, high affinity nanobody against GFP. So in, in our example here, where we can have a, a cell expressing GPI GFP, we can't really do any single particle tracking because the membrane is just full of, uh, of these GFP GPI uh, molecules. But if we, if we now label a subset of those with the fluorescent Die, then we could, uh, and then obviously that would have to be in a different spectral channel. But then we can, uh, then we can look at individual molecules. Um, and the way that looks like, so if we zoom in here in this area, so if we, um, if we think about it, so if we have a, if we have a nanobody that now detects our GFP, uh, we can label a small subset of molecules and then track these individually. Um, at the same time, if we, if we add these nanobodies to the medium, we have a, we have a plural to replenish our our label so once once these molecules start to bleach uh, that there's uh, that there's always new new binding events and uh, this would look um, um, possibly like like this in this example here we actually have a quite quite a lot of nanobodies bound already and uh, and you see uh, some some individual uh, point spread functions here uh, potentially but in, in a lot of areas so there's there's a lot of overlap and that is that is another thing that's really cool about using uh, fluorescently labeled nanobodies is that you can now titrate. So if you say, okay, this is this possibly a little bit too much, you can just add less to your uh, to your experiment. And um, obviously, the the nanobody has to reach the target. So this is for any kind of tracking where your your target is uh, extending from the cell. So for uh, GPI GFP, this works really well because it's in the outer leaflet, but also any kind of transmembrane protein that extends out of the cell can be used. And there's a number of commercially available combinations of uh, nanobodies and, and fluorophores. 
but it's all also fairly simple to label them yourself. I'm, I'm not going to go too much into detail um, on uh, on that, but there's a there's a kit available and and it works quite well. So if you have a, any specific dye you really would like to use together with a nanobody, that works. And if you have any um, receptor or membrane molecule that has already a GFP attached, then uh, just using an anti-GFP nanobody is, uh, is actually a very nice tool. I'll just give you a couple of examples now where we've used this in the, in the past. And um, one is uh, investigating the diffusion barrier at the axon initial segment. And here's a, um, uh, an image from uh, my, my PhD where we transfected neurons with uh, GPI GFP. Um, and, and again, so it's the, the, the GFP really in the, outer, uh, in the outer leaflet. And then it diffuses in the entire neuronal membrane. And um, the axon initial segment is just this proximal stretch of the, uh, uh, of the axon and it separates the somatodendritic domain from the axonal domain. And um, what we uh, what we did then is add just uh, low amounts, um, and this is in the uh, in the picomolar range of uh, fluorescently labeled nanobodies. These then attach, and we can uh, we can track them. And I hope these videos um, that they that they play. And this is um, this is two examples uh, here on the left is on the on the proximal section of the uh, of the axon image, uh, and we can see the the slow, um, relatively slow diffusion and, uh, and, um, of, of individual molecules, and they're not really traversing the entire length. And then here on the, on the right, what you see is, uh, uh, is uh, a video acquired uh, at the distal axon where we, uh, where we then see fast motion and then they also traverse much better. And looking uh, at the trajectories of these, and these are now some um, trajectories acquired with quantum dots, uh, what we noticed is just linking uh, linking all these uh, localizations uh, that we have this uh, emerging pattern here in our trajectories, uh, and this is a, uh, shows a very nice um, periodicity of uh, roughly 200 nanometers, and uh, this is very uh, very cool because it's uh, uh, exactly like the uh, periodic actin spectrum cytoskeleton. Underneath, so we uh, uh, so this was work where we looked at uh, how the diffusion in the membrane is influenced by the submembrane cytoskeleton, as one example. Now, sometimes it's not enough to just track a single a single species, a single uh, membrane molecule. So we we have here our uh, uh, GPIGSP, but um, as I said in the introduction, uh, sometimes you want to look at uh, interactions of different proteins, maybe even uh, interaction of, uh, of two diffusing membrane proteins. And one possibility is um, to, to do a dual color um, labeling approach where you then uh, label the two different proteins and image them either sequentially or simultaneously. Now, sequentially always has this problem that you, um, that if you want an, at an actual interaction, uh, it's much better to, uh, to acquire the, um, both signal at the same time, and one possibility that we that we looked into then is that instead of using uh, uh, um, so we can still use the GF GFP on the on the one hand with our um, one probe, and then here's a transmembrane um, probe that has an M honeydew. So this is spectrally very close to GFP, but because it's derived from DS red, uh, we can use a different nanobody. And the idea here is now we just label our nanobodies two different nanobodies that individually uh, detect these two, the GFP or the M-Honeydew, with different uh, flow force, and then with the right set of filters, we can image these simultaneously. And what you see here is uh, in, in, in red is the, uh, the GPI-anchored uh, protein, and then cyan, the transmembrane protein. And now I just play the, play the video. Um, so we can, we can see both now simultaneously diffusing. And you'll notice these two bright, bright spots here on the left and on the right. Um, and these are fiduciary markers so that we can uh, that we can set our imaging plane and also for for image registration. Um, David, yes, there would be a question that I guess would fit here. So uh, Maria Garcia Barrao was asking um, whether there are commercially available nanobodies directed to other proteins rather than to GFP, so directly targeting your protein of interest. Um, yes, there are already quite a few nanobodies uh, available. And uh, so one, um, 
one other advantage. Um, so if you're if you're familiar with the um, with the typical immunofluorescence where you use a primary and a secondary antibody, is a problem that re that doesn't really work for single particle tracking because uh, of the stoichiometry um, and and because it's uh, like it's two two step labeling. Uh, approach that would cluster your your proteins. Um, so that's why a lot of nanobodies are being developed, also uh, for for medical applications. Um, I'm, I don't have a list prepared, but there's nanobodies for for a lot of targets available. If you just um, if you just search for them for them online, there's more and more companies um, uh, selling those. And otherwise, I mean, what you would need is basically a llama to immunize, because these have these uh, uh, variable single domain. Uh, antibodies, where you can then uh, create nanobodies. Uh, hope that answers the question. Um, just briefly, the the data we got here um, from from this uh, dual color single particle tracking experiment is on the on the left side here. You see the uh, you see all all the trajectories uh, acquired, and then in the middle, um, an overlay of subset of trajectories for for both the uh, GSP and the M honeydew. Um, Flow four attached to the GPI anchor or the transmembrane protein, uh, and then in the background here the uh, the GFP signal of the cell. Um, M honeydew is much dimmer, which in this case is not really a problem because it's still sufficient to uh, to find a transfected cell. But you're not really because you're only really using the GFP signal. And in this case, what we used was a it was an ATO six or seven N dye and a side three B, uh, which work spectrally well together. Um, and uh, then we looked at the distribution of diffusion coefficients, and we uh, found a very nice uh, shift between the GPI anchorage and the outer leaflet, which is somewhat faster than the transmembrane, which makes sense because it uh, interacts via the cytosolic domain with the submembrane cytoskeleton. Um, that brings me already to um, to a short bit on analysis of single particle tracking data, um, and so. If if you want to do this kind of experiment, all you need is a, either your specific nanobody or a construct that has a GFP on the outside of the cell and uh, an anti-GFP traditionally labeled nanobody. Um, I would recommend something in the uh, in the order of, of picomolar concentrations, and then this is something you can really just adjust to to determine. Um, we can um, have a look at the at the analysis briefly. I just have a um, have an example where we can use TrackMate. Um, it's in in image A, but generally speaking, there's a lot of uh, a lot of approaches uh, available. Um, I'll go over the exposure um, uh, experimental parameters. Uh, so so in terms of exposure time, you you want to be somewhere in the millisecond range. That's usually where you um, where you image the motion of transmembrane uh, uh, proteins. Laser power is something where you want to be in the on always on the on the lower end um, so that you get longer trajectories um, because if you have uh, um, because you really want to avoid photo beaching or uh, photo damaging your your cell um, in terms of wavelength is it's usually very nice to use far red dyes because they're less phototoxic and uh, and the dyes uh, a lot of those dyes are very uh, very stable. Uh, so in in my experience, out of six or seven n is just by by far the uh, the best I've uh, I've played with. So you can get trajectories of several hundred frames, and we can have a look at an example later. Um, and then the label density is really something you can you can titrate and uh, and look at. Um, another thing that if I mean like a like a practical uh, advice, uh, be mindful of the timing because a lot of uh, um, Molecules. I mean, a lot of uh, transmembrane molecules have a steady turnover. So if you wait too long between uh, between your labeling and imaging, you, you will end up with a lot of uh, flow force already in endocytic vesicles, and these uh, can be uh, uh, quite a nuisance in your uh, in your imaging. And something else to keep in mind is you want to have uh, have a look at different forms of illumination. So if you can, uh, if you have a turf uh, set up, this is really nice to reduce the background. Uh, from unbound uh, fluorescently labeled nanobodies, and you can also use uh, oblique, illumi uh, oblique illumination to that end. Uh, and here's a here's just an example of a uh, uh, of a video analyzed with uh, 
with TrackMate. And uh, in this case, it's it's very simple because it's a single molecule, so we get a very uh, very nice trajectory. But you can already see from from the behavior of the molecule that this is certainly not free diffusion. So then you can uh, also go into the into the details of analyzing the uh, the motion behavior. Um, May I interrupt you here quickly? So there's a follow-up question um, from Maria, and um, whether there are any restrictions in terms of the dyes being compatible with the nanobodies? Um, so you want to look at the solubility of your um, of your dye, because if the um, if the dye is very large and very hydrophobic, you have a risk. Of, uh, of the dye actually uh, interacting with your membrane, and then it might change your diffusion behavior. Um, so any any dye that is uh, that is nicely water soluble should work. But in the end, that's something um, where I would just I would probably just just try it. Yeah. Um, so at some point, the, I mean, the, the far, some far red dyes become really big. Um, then at some point, it, the uh, the dye is about um, I mean won't reach the size of an antibody. But if, if you have something around the size of three kilo Daltons, then it might start seeing an effect there. Mm. But otherwise, solubility, yeah. if it's water soluble, it should work. Um, just very briefly here on, uh, um, so so if you're if you're new to single particle tracking, some, this is a very good, uh, this is a very good starting point uh, to just use TrackMate in, uh, in Fiji or, or ImageJ. And this will get you already a lot of a lot of results. Um, even though I have to say that most people, when they go heavily into single particling, at some point start writing their own scripts and uh, writing their own analysis. Uh, and just very briefly, so um, so any kind of uh, um, in in any single frame, you have a flow for that emitting, and and your raw data is it's just really this this point spread function. And it's uh, um, as you've probably heard in the in the course of this um, uh, this conference. Uh, it's really just a, a matter of fitting this with a with a Gaussian. Then you get the localized uh, position, and if you do this in subsequent frames, you can then link these localizations to get your trajectory and do all forms of uh, uh, of follow up analysis, like looking at the mean square displacement, etc. And um, here's just a quick example um, uh, of how this uh, this then might might look like of a uh, um, uh, of some data recorded first uh, and then analyzed with, with TrackMates where we um, have the localizations and then shown here the trajectories. And I hope that shows somewhat well, the software. Um, okay, with that, I'll just briefly open the remote desktop. I hope that works, you can, you can see um, we'll, we'll have some. Um, so for the fluorescence part, I pre-recorded some uh, some data because that was uh, a safe option. Um, so we'll, we'll just go through a few practical things. And now, if you have any any um, practical questions on on uh, for that uh, sort of uh, um, what you want to look for, I just uh, just fire away. Um, so here's a um, this is a, what I would say is a nice. Um, Image sequence where we have a uh, um, quite a few bound fluorophores, but it's not too dense to actually do single particle tracking. We have a very nice signal to noise, so we can localize them. And uh, and from from these, if you and I'm not sure how fluent the motion is on the uh, uh, on the video platform, but we can get trajectories of up to hundreds, uh, uh, several hundred frames actually. And this is recorded with Atos 647N. Um, I'll just open a um, couple more data sets. We'll have a look at that. By the way, um, David, it's uh, fluid, so we can see the particles moving. OK, that's very nice. Good. So here's a, um, this is actually the same cell, um, and uh, just with uh, less laser power. and uh, uh, and what you can what you can see here, and it's a different uh, uh, it's actually different uh, uh, different part of the cell. But what you can see here is it's uh, it appears a lot denser. And we have here on the sides 
um, a lot of uh, a lot of area where we can um, I mean we can still see the motion, but we can't really see individual molecules. And this is uh, this is an example of where you you just need a bit more laser power, and it will help you in two ways. First, it'll increase your um, uh, the quality of your localizations, but at the same time, what it will also do is bleach some of the molecules, so you get more into the regime where you can do single emitter fitting. Because one of one of the real problems is as uh, every every time these uh, these fluorophores meet, um, you, you you'll have a hard time figuring out uh, which trajectory belongs to which, even though there's already um, some some approaches to uh, to solve that. Um, I have another example here. Um, one of the one of the things you also want to uh, want to keep in mind is that you have a stable setup because uh, if you if you have some focus drift, uh, this can be um, can be really an issue. So this is this actually started as a very nice imaging session, um, and what you can what you can see here. Um, is that some of the molecules um, are, are out of focus, and uh, and in this case you want to um, you want to be sure where you're um, where you're actually imaging. Um, so um, what we can what we can actually see here is um, so the um, so the bright ones that are in focus. Um, uh, like 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 these here, but then there's also the much dimmer ones that are slightly out of focus. And if you look very closely, uh, you can even see like a slightly uh, slightly tilted um, point spread function here. So it's not perfectly line system. But this is the two. Um, this is the lower membrane and the uh, and the upper membrane. So this is in a very flat part of a uh, of a cos seven cell uh, at the periphery. So we can actually see out of focus. Uh, molecules diffusing on the top membrane, and then in focus here is the is the bottom membrane. Um, but for this kind of imaging, focus stability is uh, is very important. And uh, Pedro is just asking, how about tracking molecules in that? Um, yeah, so this is um, it's definitely possible. Uh, you with with fluorescence, you're um, you're always uh, with a sing, uh, simple point spread function like this. Uh, this is this is quite tricky, but you could do points for function engineering. There's different approaches, so this is definitely uh, it's definitely possible, but it's not from from this kind of data not not trivial. So we need um, need to play with the optics. And also, if you look at the uh, the points for function uh, of a single molecule here in fluorescence in that it's uh, um, it's not very uh, I mean it's not not trivial. Um, and we'll come to some 3D tracking uh, later. Um, and sometimes, um, just as a um, as a quick uh, quick last example um, here, so sometimes when you're when you're imaging, it's really um, that there's not not a lot of uh, not a lot of action going on. Um, and what what you see, I mean, you see like here, there's a few molecules blinking. There's a little bit of what looks like um, autofluorescence. So this is a um, this is just an example where the um, where it, it just didn't work at all. So there's a single there's one single molecule that, that's diffusing a little bit here on the side. But um, if you're for example if your nanobody um, is, is bad, it's no longer binding, or if um, or you just took the wrong one, um, this is the kind of uh, so you, so you always if you if you have single molecule sensitivity, you'll always see something. But it's uh, this is an example of where where the experiment just didn't work, um, so then you can't do do any tracking here. There's another question from Rodrigo. So, is it possible to track single particles with nanobodies also in other organisms like bacteria, for example? Um, so, as long as you can uh, attach it, uh, that should work. So, if you, for example, if you um, if you have a bacterium and you have um, again your your target. On the outer, uh, on the outside, uh, then it works. Um, as soon as you want to do intracellular single particle tracking, um, you would have to go to photoactivatable um, fluorescent molecules, which give you a lot less photons. So it's, it's in general it's trickier. Um, so this is um, 
focusing here really on uh, on single particle tracking with, with nanobodies, but obviously there's uh, there's different labeling approaches. So you could go directly for a photo activatable um, fluorescent protein, for example, if you want to image inside a cell or inside a bacterium. But other than that, as long as uh, as uh, um, accessible to the label, yes, definitely. Just have to see. Um, so one one thing that's really nice about um, cells is if they're growing on a glass cover, they're nice and flat. So as soon as you have a bacterium, you'll you'll probably run into issues that uh, that it's a very uh, high curvature. All right. Um, I would finish the first bit. We'll have a very short break. And you can now ask questions on the nanobody part, and then we'll continue with IceCat in just about a minute. So if anyone has any questions, feel, feel free to ask away. And uh, if there's, ah, OK, Roma is asking, uh, any experience with membrane permeable? That is, halo tags or similar dyes for intracellular tracking. Um, I played with membrane permeable dyes, but not for, um, I actually haven't done single particle tracking with those. Um, it's, a uh, it's interesting though. I mean, anything that will, um, that will become fluorescent upon binding is, uh, is always a candidate. And there's, uh, I mean, theoretically you could even uh, electroporate uh antibodies or nanobodies into a cell but i haven't actually haven't seen that done uh for for particle tracking so no i can't really i uh, can't really comment on that sorry and uh while we're on a short break i'll link this question with rodrigo's question because uh nanobodies will have to go through the cell wall and despite the fact they're really small they're still big or if you're working with brand negative you they would have to go through the outer membrane but uh, halo tags would be an excellent alternative if you want to track uh, proteins inside bacteria. So we have another question from Rajesh. Could you please comment how to differentiate between single particles, single particle tracing and the drift? Yeah, that's, a, um, that's an excellent question. So you've seen in one of the earlier videos um, some fiduciary markers, so you can always use those. Um, and then use them for drift correction. Otherwise, if you have a very high density, um, you could even look at uh, correlated motion of the of the particles and then take the drift out. Even though on the time scales where you where you do your single particle tracking and how you analyze the data, um, even a little bit of drift would not make a huge difference. I would um, I would dare to say. I would say we can continue with section two then. We have no more questions, so fire fire away. Yeah, if there's any more questions, I mean, you can always ask questions on the chat and then we'll, uh, we can come back to those later. So uh, section two is now single particle tracking via ISCAT. And um, in, I mean, we, we talked a lot about fluorescence and you're, if, if any of you have done any sort of fluorescence experiment, you know that there's uh, quite a few limitations. For example, eventually your label will bleach. So if you take too long to focus, uh, it's basically, basically gone by the time you, you start your experiment. You always suffer from phototoxicity. So you kind of want to reduce the uh, intensity, but then you have uh, bad localization precision. Um, so, so there's there's quite a few limitations, and in the end, it's it's really this finite photon yield, um, and this is where where scattering uh, really is a uh, is a brilliant alternative. And if we take a, um, a gold nanoparticle, for example, as a scattering label, um, we can get via light scattering an unlimited um, amount of uh, of signal, and it's it's permanent, unlike quantum dots that blink. And uh, uh, already in the in the 90s, uh, Kusumi was tracking um, gold nanoparticles on, on membranes um, at uh, 25 
microsecond exposure times already with the um, localization precision of 20 nanometers. So this is this is something. I mean, if I mean, you, you get a very nice signal and you can do super fast tracking. So this is on the order of uh, uh, a thousand times faster. So the um, all the other um, fluorescence videos I've shown you were at uh, 20 millisecond exposure time recorded. And um, and you're probably familiar um, the, with the um, with the model uh, of compartmentalized membranes based on on these observations of this hopping uh, diffusion. And um, what we're doing in the group is interferometric scattering microscopy. And I'll just very briefly talk you through the concept, and then we'll um, we'll look at some uh, some data. Now, essentially, what you uh, if you if you focus a laser on the back focal plane of an objective, you um, you have a wide field elimination of your uh, um, of the cover slip, and uh, what you get is then just the back reflection on the uh, on the camera. And if you place now a gold nanoparticle, for example, in this beam, what will happen is that it starts scattering. And this scattered light will then be reflected back and focused onto your camera. Now, the intensity um, of, uh, of your signal on the, on the camera now is um, really the, um, the squared sum here of, uh, uh, of, your, of your reference and your uh, scattering electric field. And if we break this down, um, we uh, we basically get here the reflected light. Um, we get the Rayleigh scattering, and this scales to the sixth power of the diameter of your of your particle. And uh, then we also have this cross term, uh, which is uh, the interference between uh, between these two. And this scales now to the third power of your diameter. And this is really the um, the the Rayleigh scattering. Mm, becomes very, very small, very quickly, if you have small particles. And that's why with dark field microscopy, for example, you're limited to some, somewhere around 14 nanometers. However, because this cross term here scales only to the third power uh, of the diameter, even smaller particles can be detected um, by looking at the interference. So if we take uh, here 14 nanometer gold particles on, on the cover glass, um, you can very nicely see here the dark uh, dots with the um, with the rings surrounded uh, with a very, very nice contrast. And this is basically the interference of our reference with the, uh, with the reflected light. And with iSCAT, we're basically shot noise limited in our signal to noise. And because uh, um, scattering is, um, is a coherent process, we, we have the, the advantage um, that we can just increase our laser power to get more to get more signal. Um, now, an example for single particle tracking um, via iSCAT of gold nanoparticles from our group um, is here like a, um, a, a lipid, uh, a supported lipid bilayer, an artificial membrane, where we have single gold nanoparticles now attached to lipids that we're tracking here up to with up to 1 million frames per second uh, with a localization of uh, a precision of less than two nanometers. So very, um, very impressive uh, imaging. And this is done obviously in a, a, in a super clean environment on an artificial membrane and in, in two dimensions. Um, and one of, the, one of the things we have to, um, we have to uh, acknowledge or, or, um, or what's important about, um, about scattering here is that our point spread function very much depends on the axial position of our of our particles. So if we have a um, gold nanoparticle here that is moving uh, in uh, in Z, um, the um, the contrast we get changes, and that's because of the of the interference. Um, so we can get here um, a negative, a very negative contrast. Here, actually, in the um, when we're um, in the in in between these two, in the um, in the focal. Um, Plane, we can we can see how the uh, how the actual contrast here in the in the very center is uh, hardly any different from uh, from our from our background. And here we get a positive contrast. So we can use this information to extract the the position uh, in in that of our of our particle, and this enables us to do high precision three dimensional tracking. And um, one of the one of the issues here, however, is if you have very uh, very low contrast in the center, this is obviously not ideal 
for localizing the particle. So what we can do here is that we use the radial symmetry of, uh, um, of our point spread function to, to do the localization and still get a very high precision, even if we're here um, at, a, at a contrast level where it's not different, not much different from the background. And this three-dimensional information uh, we can now use to do um, 3D tracking, for example, on a, on a cell. And there the contrast changes can be used to then deduce the axial position. And this is here from uh, uh, data from Rich Taylor from our group, uh, recorded at 10,000 frames per second on a, on, a, on a live cell. And here on the left side, you can see the, um, the data and on the right side, the, the trajectory. Uh, another example where we've done uh, single particle tracking with uh, via iSCAT uh, and, and this time on, on neurons is where we have here the, um, on, the, on the left side a reflected in intensity of our signal and then a differential signal. Um, so if you, uh, if you think about it, um, because a lot of the reflected light, your, your background is, is static, you can subtract that. But if your gold nanoparticle is now moving in the differential signal, it will very nicely um, stand out. And you can then use that to track. And in this case, it was again uh, GPI, GSP, your particle. And you see the localizations um, here. Um, and um, David, maybe I can interrupt you for some questions. So we have one question um, regarding the scattering light from the gold nanoparticle. And there was a naive idea whether there's a directionality um, of the um, scattered light compared to the laser reflection. Um, at the cover class imaging medium interface and um, whether one sees these fluctuations in the signal. So I, Sorry, could so you? I guess the, um, if I get the question correctly, Julian, um, you think that laterally you would have um, an unstable signal from the golden nanoparticle. But um, so yeah, what I would say is that um, due to the white field illumination, your illumination or your field of view is way larger than your nanoparticle. So you don't have a lateral gradient and therefore your response from the gold nanoparticle does not depend on the position. If that answers your question. Yeah, okay. And then there's another question by Ricardo, um, whether the radial symmetry calculation is similar to the one implemented in SERF. Actually, good question. Um, one I would uh, pass on to you. Um, I think not entirely. I mean, we we maybe we can come back to to the data analysis at the uh, at the end again, um, mm -hmm. and just just continue continue for now. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sounds good. I get back to you, Ricardo, uh, on that. Okay, so here um, just the example where we then have uh, um, see our trajectories, and this is uh, this matched very nicely what we've seen in fluorescence with the uh, with the quantum dots earlier. And if we're um, so for the for single particle tracking uh, via IceCAT again, our um, um, experimental parameters um, we, we just have to uh, I'll just briefly go through them, and then we'll have a look at the at the setup and uh, and some uh, some live data. So again. Um, we need to set our exposure time. Generally, we're using uh, CMOS, so we have very uh, very short exposure times. We we'll, um, usually start around one millisecond, but we can actually go down in, into the microsecond range with uh, with fast cameras, um, and that just needs more laser power. Um, uh, so laser power really is, uh, um, yeah, you, you just adjust it to to get the right uh, right amount of signal, and it's really important for the for the camera that you have a, um, a high well depth because um, you have a lot of reflected light. So we're, we're really um, uh, imaging at the, uh, uh, at the upper end of the well depth of the camera, ideally. Um, wavelengths, again, um, I mean, lower wavelengths, we get a better resolution. But then we have to see um, where we get a good signal um, from, our, from our gold nanoparticles. And that depends uh, uh, on, the, on the size. For the label density, um, here, um, yeah, um, well, and we'll, we'll we'll look at that uh, live in a in a moment. Um, something to keep in mind is that it's uh, that it's more difficult to label with a gold nanoparticle than um, with a, with an antibody, just just because of the size. And even if we link the the gold nanoparticle with the same 
um, with the same nanobody uh, to the same label, our labeling efficiency um, is, is, is much lower. And that's likely also um, due to uh, the bigger size, so we have lower um, lower diffusion in, in solution of the gold nanoparticles, but it might also be some steric or electrostatic uh, repulsion. And then timing, pretty much same thing. Um, just have to figure out when when to label, when to image. Um, so if you want to pre-label your um, your cells and then then do the imaging later, um, but you don't want all your labels to be internalized um, already. Um, yeah, and then here for um, uh, I still have this this up, but uh, but really the um, the illumination is uh, um, in this case is wide field um, for uh, for the eyes get. So we're not uh, we're actually not using uh, any of these. And with that, I would say uh, we'll we'll start the practical part, and I'll be joined by Michelle. So I hope this works now. Um, I'll just. Go to the setup, and I hope you can see. Can you turn on the? Yeah, awesome. So now um, this is uh, this is our setup. I will just um, just talk you through um, through it briefly, um, and we'll change the laser to. Five fifty, so we can see it. Laser is on. Actually, no, the laser is not on because we're interlocked. Okay, okay, just a second. Where did I go wrong? Yeah, now it's on. Okay, cool. I'll just walk around and then we'll, uh, um, I'll, I'll talk you through the, through the setup. I hope, um, so I'm wearing the microphone. I hope this is working. Otherwise, Pedro, you, um, as soon as you can't hear me anymore, please interject and we can have, I can change this a little bit so you can see. I'll let you know. No worries. Yeah, my back. Uh huh. Well, okay. So, um, in the in the main um, camera, you can now see here is the laser, um, and it's a uh, fiber coupled um, into our system. And we'll just talk about this IceCat module that is here attached to our um, microscope body. So this is you can you can see this as an extension that uh, um, that you can use to upgrade any any system. To, to do ice get and what um, um, I'll just walk you through the through the beam path and uh, that explains the the technique already quite well so the laser is coupled in um, in here and then we just have these two first mirrors to to position the laser beam um, and then we go here um, through our wide field lens this is a typical 90 10 um, beam splitter that we use uh, in any kind of um, uh, setup where we then couple our beam into the um, into the microscope, and I'm not sure if you can you can see it. Okay, um, so now um, the light then shines through the um, goes through the objective, illuminates the sample, and then we collect the reflected light again through our 9010, and then here onto the um, onto our CMOS where we here have the uh, imaging lens. And I hope that was understandable. Otherwise, please ask questions and we can go into the, into the details. Um, but first we'll um, stop frying the cell and uh, start, start the experiment. Um, so this is the setup. Now as a second step, Um, we have here, uh, 
our system. So this is our um, this is our camera control software that's in-house uh, developed, and currently we're just uh, so this is the signal on the CMOS, so we're currently not seeing anything, and um, we can now if we remove the laser beam from the from the uh, uh, the beam block. Uh, so now we uh, we are illuminating the sample, and what you can see here is the now is the cell. Um, and if I move around a little bit, and I hope maybe we can, if we increase the signal a bit, maybe you can see a bit bit better. So, um, so if I move around, it might become a bit more, bit better visible. So this is here a cell. This is a it's a HeLa cell that we transfected with uh, GPI GFP. You can see at the at the um, at the top here, there's a there's a few philopodia uh, moving around, and this is here this is here the cell. So if I move slowly past. You can you can see you can see the outline, and what we'll do now is we can um, enable um, subtraction of the background, and that didn't work because it didn't normalize. Okay, so now we have a um, uh, we subtract the background, and now you can see the um, you can see the cell um, a bit more clearly. And let me just see if I can focus a little bit. So we can, you can see how the how the background changes uh, depending on the focal plane. So um, and this um, all this little um, little motion, this little wiggling, um, is the is now that's uh, um, well any sort of vesicle, any material inside the cell. Because of course, um, just like a gold nanoparticle, um, we'll we'll do in a in a moment anything in the in the cell that um, will also any material in the cell will also scatter. So we get a signal from that. And what we'll do now is I will pipette um, gold nanoparticles onto the sample live, and hopefully we'll see them land, bind, and diffuse. And um, yeah, wish me luck. Um, so the Gold nanoparticles. If you, you you see them, I mean, there's 50 nanometer gold, so it shines uh, reddish, and it's, uh, these were coupled again uh, uh, with a nanobody against GFP by a biotin strapped avidin. So this one is a um, so you can also get a nanobody with a that's biotinylated, and now we have strapped avidin gold. And I'll try to pipe it onto the sample. Uh, Michelle, do you want to watch if something happens? Okay, adding the gold now. And now we wait and see if anything lands. And now we'll now we'll change to differential. Um differential image. So now we should see now we should see anything um uh, any gold particles. So um so subtracting frames and um, what you what you can see now um, is um, in the center. I mean, this is just the motion of the cell, but here on the on the sides now we're basically looking for gold particles. This looks like one here. This definitely um, looks like a gold particle. Here's here's one that you can see moving. Um, I'm not sure. Can you see my mouse? On the on the screen, yeah. Yes, okay, good. Perfect. Yeah. And um, here, if you look here in, on the on the side, um, these brief um, um, these brief signals that are just floating past very quickly. I mean, this is unbound gold particles. Um, um, so most most of them here with a with a light contrast. So just to be on the on the safe side, I actually added a lot uh, in this case. Um, so if you want to, um, so for for an experiment, you would then go to a to a useful concentration. Um, I mean, obviously you don't want to wait for for several hours for something to bind, but if you add too much, at some point your sample will be crowded. Um, and we can now move. If we move around, you can see the outline of the cell, obviously because of the um, 
of the differential. Now we can see if here, for example, um, on this side where we have um, like a little philopodium, see if we can get this a bit better into focus in the center. Um, so here, for example, here, this is a very nice one. You can see that it's moving, moving around um, on the on the side of the cell. And then, then here's a here's a gold nanoparticle that's diffusing. And then we have several ones here that are a bit higher up. So, um, um, and you can you can see. I hope this uh, this comes across on the uh, on the video. Uh, these very frequent contrast inversions. So they they just switch um, switch from uh, from uh, negative to a positive contrast you, you you get the rings this is uh, the the rings is a very good sign that it's uh, actual gold particles and not uh just um cellular components and uh, the contrast inversions that's what we can then use for three-dimensional tracking and here this looks like this one of those is actually attached here to this philopodium of the cell um but it's mostly staying here um, so that's the other thing. So you want to look at the at the particles whether you get um, whether you get immobile particles that just uh, bind and stick, or uh, or if they're nice uh, nicely diffusing on the on the membrane. We'll just go back to the um, so this is the this is the raw image, and now if we just take the background off without the differential, you can. I mean, it's just a different way of looking at the data. Um, but as you can imagine, the localization and then post-processing takes quite a bit. So here's a... There's a question regarding the background of the background the test between the two different versions. Okay, um, so very briefly, so what we're, what we're seeing now um, is the background um, subtraction where we just moved the field of view over empty cover glass to get the um, get the background from the basically from the camera um, and then we can subtract that so everything we we see here is uh, um, is already minus uh, uh, any any noise from the uh, from the camera and Um, so that's a very simple explanation. I mean, we can do smaller particles, but then it starts to get difficult to see them by eye, and we just wanted to do an experiment that works. Um, so we wanted to be on the safe side. I suggested 80, but uh, but Michelle was like, no, that's too much. <laughs> so definitely, it's possible to go to much smaller particles. Um, however, keep in mind, if you're, um, if you're on a perfect... Um, and we can just change the change the view again. So if you're on a perfect uh, lipid bilayer um, with uh, minimal background and absolutely no contamination, yeah, obviously it's it's much easier um, to to detect um, a particle than if you're in a relatively dirty environment of a cell. They get a lot of speckle and a lot of background from the cell itself because on on these time scales where our particle is diffusing, a lot of things in inside the cell. Uh, also move. If you think about, I mean, like a like a ribosome um, diffusing in the cytoplasm will give you some signal. So you'll you'll just, I mean, uh, if it was only one in clear liquid, you could very nicely see it. But however, uh, because the cytoplasm is just full of material, um, you'll pick up all of these and they'll overlap. So that's the um, yeah, that's the challenge with uh, with ice So we'll just move around a little bit on the cell, see if. There's something else happening on the on the other side. Um, so it looks like there's something bound here at the at the top, but it's mostly stationary. Uh, here's a particle that's wiggling. So that's another thing you'll see. Sometimes they just get stuck in a um at some point of the cell and then they'll 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 wiggle around however um some particles diffuse diffuse freely <laughs> thank you
So we have an, another question from Julien. Would the despeckling element compromise the contrast of the interference? Uh, example, diffusing or shaking the laser beam. Um, so if we um, shake the laser beam, that would not, um, um, because we get uh, the speckle from, um, not from the laser beam, but actually from the cell here, um, the speckle from the laser beam we can we can account for. Um, so uh, I guess, um, what would you say? Um, the question was. Um, yeah, okay. sure. okay. So um, in principle, it depends on the coherence length of your laser. Um, if you have a long coherence length, then obviously you will get speckle from different optical elements in your beam path. So we tend to use um, low coherence lasers that are not incoherent, but still coherent enough that we get interference up to several microns above the cover class. And with that, you can reduce the background that you get. Um, with advanced um, image analysis, we could also account for um, higher spectral background. But the spectral that you now see here is actually the um, remaining um, scattering signal from your cell. So that is um, yeah, information that you don't want to just throw out. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> That's why I brought the expert. By the way, David and Michelle, I sort of lied to you both. Uh, there is actually a workshop after you. So that starts uh, at, at now, basically. So you can carry on. And people, if they want to move to the zero cost workshop, they're more than welcome. If they want to stay in chat with David and Michelle, they're also very welcome. Um, it's up to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, we're pretty much done. But any more questions, uh, you're more than welcome to ask. Um, you will also, I'll just very quickly go back here to the acknowledgement slide, um, because we're, we're a large team. And uh, there's a lot of people uh, here involved that make uh, our experiments possible. And I uh, um, want to especially uh, also thank Vahid Zanokta uh, for giving us the opportunity to work here. Um, here's a picture of uh, the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light, where we uh, enjoy um, this kind of weather every day. Um, and here are the references for the uh, data shown, um, just to have, uh, to have that on screen for a moment. If you have any further questions, just please stay on uh, um, on the session and, and, and feel free to ask. And otherwise, here at the bottom, you'll also see my email address. So you can just uh, also send me an email later. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. It was lovely. And now let's see if we have questions from the audience. I think there was still one question open from Ricardo. Uh, oh, yes, from the image analysis. So I have been writing them all, uh, having writing them down. So actually, uh, yes, uh, the, is the radial symmetry calculation similar to the one implemented in SURF? That was the question. Yes. Um, OK, so I know that is uh, basically your work, Ricardo. So <laughs> I'm not. But I think that um, your point is also that you're using the gradient of the intensity that you record to find the center of your distribution. And so in principle, if this is the basic concept, then um, using the radial symmetry of the confocal ice, or not the confocal, but the ice with TSF, um, is the same. The only difference is the signal that we are analyzing is the um, full electric field. So we are um, analyzing the amplitude interface. And in your case, it's only the intensity that you can use. And that sorts that. Ah, OK, so we have another question from Julien. How can polarization help? Can you discriminate the GNP polarization signal from the laser reference and split them? Um, yeah, that's actually also a really good question. So um, to uh, increase uh, the 
um, outcoming signal or the, the signal that you can detect, you can also actually, that was also shown already, uh, use polarizing um, beam splitter um, instead of the 9010 beam splitter that David just showed you on our setup. And with that, you can then um, yeah, discriminate with a higher efficiency uh, your incident uh, illumination from your scattered and reflected field. Okay, so Denitza is asking, uh, thank you, David, sorry, I got confused. How does iSCAT work exactly? Wanted you always get the effect of scattering plus reflecting when you put gold particles in your sample? Or is it about the size of the particles being selected to optimize the reflection slash scattering ratio? Um, first of all, sorry to, sorry to confuse. Um, Good question also. So anything, I mean, anything we put on the microscope will scatter. The only question is, can we can we detect that? And if it's a small nanoparticle, the pure scattering just won't be enough. Now, what we do in iSCAT is we exploit the fact that we have an interference between the reflection and the scattering of our nanoparticle. And that's what we're detecting. Um, so maybe I can add something here. So um, if you would only want to look at the scattering, so doing dark field, you would need to um, take further measures to um, get rid of your excitation. So basically, if you do eye scat, that's the kind of simple, uh, yeah, most simple microscopy technique that you can do, never with the older. But the problem is um, that you um, need more advanced data analysis to extract your signal. So I guess that's the difference. But your your question is perfectly right in the sense that um, whatever you place um, now on top of the setup, you would always get set, uh, scattering and reflection. And therefore, we use actually the gold nanoparticles because due to their um, plasmonic um, property, um, we can distinguish them from the dielectric um, matter that scatters uh, like the cell, for example. Okay, let's wait a couple more minutes to see if we have more questions. Uh, actually, I, I will bother you guys and ask you one. So if you want to do this uh, inside living cells, uh, I imagine that's quite a challenge. So I have actually two questions. If you want to do this inside living cells and if you can modulate the properties um, or not the properties, but if you can modulate what you're measuring and extract more information if you change metals, for example? Um, yeah, two very good questions. <laughs> so um, imaging inside a living cell is a challenge, especially in white field ice as you can see here. Illumination cone, everything scatters, and therefore you get this um, well-known heterogeneous speckle pattern um, from your cell. But what we are doing, what we don't show here, but what we are currently working on is um, a confocal iSCAT version. So we are basically then spatially filtering um, our uh, signal and um, getting optical slices of the cell so that we can also ex carry out these experiments inside the cell. And yeah. And regarding the, the different <laughs> metals, can you play? with uh, the properties that you're extracting. So now you're tracking gold and uh, you have a-, a Yeah, you could also go to silver or something else. And um, you could play with that, but um, the point is that you wanna stay in the um, visible regimes and the optical regime. And then the gold nanoparticles are the most suitable. Okay, okay. Um, so Denitza has another question. Uh, I, get, I guess what is confusing for me is that I have used gold nanoparticles in reflection to assess my PSF, and I don't remember the same dark bright ratio that you are seeing below and above focus, sorry. So I was wondering what is the difference in what I was doing and you are doing. Uh, Denitza was using 80 nanometer gold nanoparticles, uh, and she adds, anyways, thanks a lot for clarifying. I was just curious. 
Um, so with um, 18 nanometer gold nanoparticles, the scattering term, um, as David has shown you on his slide, um, actually dominates the interference term. So what you then get in terms of your PSF is mainly the scattering and not interference because it's just um, yeah it's basically behind this huge signal that you collect. If you go to smaller particles, your scattering term drops with the volume square, and therefore you can basically neglect that, and the um, remaining signal is then the interference term that is amplified uh, by your reflection. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. If uh, there's no more pressing questions, and again, David shared his email. You can reach both David and Michelle via email. Um, so I guess I'll end this uh, workshop here. And let me just end by thanking you both very much for a marvelous job. It was really good fun. And um, and yeah, I'm, I have, might have to come and visit and play a bit with uh, with your system. <laughs> After after the whole COVID situation. <laughs> you guys want to add something else? Or you're done? Uh, I think we're, we're pretty much done. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, Thanks for having us. Sorry? Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Yes. No, very nice. I, I like to see everyone with a lab coat. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> very nice. Very nice. <laughs> this is this is going to be the, the perfect finish. You both with a lab coat in the in the frame. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so once I close you all this will end so i will say goodbye ciao, ciao and thank you all for attending the ones that are still here the 20 that are still here <laughs> thank you guys bye bye thank you bye 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 <laughs> you left but we're still in yeah. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye, bye. <laughs>